Hi, everyone. This is Laszlo Montgomery of the China History Podcast, coming to you from the 21st Century China Center on the campus of the University of California, San Diego. The 21st Century China Center is a leading university-based think tank that produces scholarly research and informed policy discussions on China and U.S.-China relations. It is my great honor and privilege to be here with the three editors of a new and timely book called China Tripping, Encountering the Everyday in the People's Republic, hot off the press from Roman and Littlefield. With me here today are Professors Perry Link, Paul Pickowitz, and Jeremy Murray. Perry Link is the Chancellorial Chair for Teaching Across Disciplines at the University of California, Riverside, and is Emeritus Professor of East Asian Studies at Princeton. Among China watchers, Perry Link is perhaps best known as the co-translator of the Tiananmen Papers. His recent books include An Anatomy of Chinese, Rhythm, Metaphor, Politics, and a translation of the memoirs of the Chinese astrophysicist Fang Li Zhe, entitled The Most Wanted Man in China, My Journey from Scientist to Enemy of the State. Welcome, Perry. Pleasure to be here. And Paul Pickowitz is a distinguished professor of history and Chinese studies at the University of California, San Diego, and the inaugural holder of the UC San Diego Endowed Chair in Modern Chinese History. He's the author and co-editor of more than 15 books, including one on my bookshelf, China on Film, A Century of Exploration, Confrontation, and Controversy, that introduces the history and development of Chinese cinema. Welcome, Paul. Lovely to be here. And Jeremy Murray is an associate professor of history at Cal State University, San Bernardino. Dr. Murray's research interests include Hainan Island and its place in modern Chinese history, marginal histories of China, film and popular culture and history, Asian history and culture, and related subjects. His teaching covers all periods of Chinese history, as well as the modern history of East Asia and contemporary Asian culture. Welcome, Jeremy Murray. Thank you. It's great to be here. And it's such a great pleasure and honor for me to host this program, especially with you two veterans of U.S.-China relations and scholarship, and to produce this program in cooperation with the 21st Century China Center. Who said a BA in Chinese history will get you nowhere in life? I've read China Tripping cover to cover and wallowed in all the reminiscences of so many early visitors to China. All the stories are quick reads, just a few minutes each, and as someone who made their first trip in the summer of 1980, it sure brought back a lot of memories. Paul Pickowitz, where did this idea for China tripping come about? Well, that's a great question, and that's a good place to start. Uh, it's as simple as this. Uh, I actually made a trip to China very early on in 1971, even before Nixon. And uh, people in my generation typically kept diaries and so on and so forth. But uh, we never wrote up our experiences. We're supposed to be there over the years, 70s, 80s, 90s, on up to the present time, to do research and publish the research findings. But along the way, we have lots of personal encounters, uh, daily life kinds of things. You bump into people, you think you know a lot about China, and then you discover there are lots of things you don't know, surprises. Uh, you think you know a lot about yourself, <laughs> and then you discover all sorts of things you didn't know about yourself. But people never wrote these up. They might keep them in their diaries, or they might have them in the back of their head. So we got the idea of, let's take that period from the early 1970s, when people from America first started going to China, uh, virtually all the way up to the present, and let's ask people for what we were describing as aha moments. In other words, I'm there, I'm doing something, and then, oh my goodness, something happens and you begin to understand something that you didn't realize before about yourself, about the people you're meeting. So it's about human encounters. And uh, our main goal was to round up people covering this period of time who were willing to share with us very short, in and out, tell us something, an aha moment uh, that uh, you remember vividly from the past. And then the job was to identify the people, get them going, and write up their material. The aha moments came in daily life, too. This wasn't asking people a summary of their research. It was uh, living in China, and things happen that make you realize something about China or about yourself that you didn't know before, quite separately from your research, perhaps. We were lucky to have a group of people who were willing to 
share uh, vulnerable and sometimes embarrassing uh, stories, which was a big part of, um, uh, it became a big part of the, the driving force of the project, that we weren't necessarily saying, um, you know, I, I knew everything uh, in terms of uh, the way things were going to happen, the way things were going to develop in China from the start. These were my stumbling stories, sometimes embarrassing stories. And the project took on um, shape as we, as we went along. And the idea of these very short stories, averaging about a thousand words each, uh, developed along uh, along the way as well. So one of the challenges we faced, and we met often, the three of us, to try to work this out, was how to identify the people we wanted to write. And I think one of the things we were trying to do was go for a diversity of voices. Uh, and so this meant people who had been visiting China in the early period of the early and mid-70s, the 80s, and then all the way up to the present time. So you have multiple generations of China scholars. China's changing all the time during this period of time. Even those of us who went back frequently were finding whenever we went back, the China we thought we knew wasn't there anymore, or lots of it wasn't there anymore. Some of it was still there. Uh, and uh, we wanted to get uh, so people in different age groups, uh, t people in, with different academic specialties, but uh, more uh, experiential diversity. So we have uh, men, we have women, we have uh, ethnic Chinese, uh, we have uh, an African-American uh, young man who was a graduate student, uh, and so on and so on and so on, so that we get as many different voices as possible. Did you give authors specific parameters for their contributions? Were there particular things you were aiming for and or trying to avoid? What did the planning and writing of the book entail? Uh, we asked each person to reflect on this idea of an aha moment, that is, something that made her or him realize something about China that wasn't planned and may have been surprising. And to keep it to a telling anecdote, we use that phrase as well, so that it's brief and interesting, as an anecdote should be, but also telling in that it reveals something about China that wasn't appreciated before. And we did have a, a get-together with, I think, about six or seven of the original authors, and we started to, to kick around a few different ideas. Uh, one crucial thing in the beginning was that we weren't going to have overly long pieces. And we had a few of those come in, and we were able to divide them up uh, in a way that I think worked really well. But there was a key, a key component there that we're not, we're not doing autobiographical things. We're doing, as, as Perry said, these sort of anecdotes. Yeah, this is a great point. And uh, it resulted in a book, if I can say this, great bedtime reading. That is to <laughs> say, each of the uh, entries takes what, three, four minutes to read. So you're in and out and you get it and you chuckle and then you can nod off to sleep, pick the book up again. You don't have to begin at the beginning. You can jump right into the middle, look at the table of contents. You may know one of the people or you may like the sound of the uh, item that's going to be discussed and you jump, you can go back and forth. You're in the 1990s, you're back to the 70s, you're up in the 20 teens uh, and so forth. And so it's a, it's a fun read in that sense. Uh, lots of surprises. What, were the, what was the earliest story? What year? And what, what years does this cover? What's the latest story? How far do we come? So the earliest one, I was actually in, I was a graduate student at the time, and I was in the very first uh, group of American-based, university-based uh, China scholars, all of them graduate students, uh, to go to China after 1949. It was in the summer of 1971. And so that's the earliest one. Uh, and my entry is, uh, one of my entries is the first one in the book. Uh, and then we cover it, we try to get chronological coverage going all the way up to virtually the eve of the publication of the book. So the last one, I believe, is in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, Melinda Leo, who's somebody who wrote, a journalist. Uh, we, we don't just have academics. We have some business people. We have some journalists. Uh, and she had a lot of experience in China over the years and did a couple of pieces for us. But she, we end up with Melinda uh, in 2016. In 1971, who who was who was with you? Who might what names do we know of? Well, I'll just pop out one name, uh, really for the uh, not just the China studies field, but also for popular media. Susan Shirk, my ah, colleague here at course. the University of California, San Diego, in the School of School of Global Policy and Strategy. Uh, she was in the group. She was a grad student at the time at MIT, and we were all in those days. We wanted to go to China. 
but you couldn't get in. The passport was not even valid for travel in China. And so if you were going abroad to do your dissertation research, regardless of whether you were an historian or a literature scholar or a sociologist, you'd have to pick between Taiwan and Hong Kong. That was the norm. That's what many of our mentors had done. So I picked Hong Kong, and a lot of the people picked Hong Kong. Uh, and there was a place called the University Service Center uh, on Argyle Street in Kowloon. And I met, you know, 15, 20, 25 graduate students from all over the United States. And these are people I'd never met before. We bonded and uh, got to know each other really well. And at one point, we said, you know, we're here. It's not going to happen, but why don't we just apply, you know, to go? And it turned out behind the scenes things were indeed unfolding uh, secretly uh, on the Ch Sino-American diplomatic front. And we were surprised, uh, blown away really, by getting an invitation uh, to enter China in late June 1971 and uh, spent about a month there and so forth. So that was uh, – we start from that point in this book and then we go on up. Perry went shortly thereafter and then toward the back of the book, uh, you know, people like uh, Jeremy – who uh, were, you know, off in China doing dissertation research uh, and encountering all sorts of unusual things and really had the ability to talk about, talk about them in lively, uh, really human terms, uh, just very warm kind of uh, feeling. An important part of the background for me and I think for Paul too is that we were idealistic leftist students at the time. Uh, Paul and I and Susan Shirk, a lot of us, were opposed to the United States war in Vietnam. And therefore, I'll speak only for myself here so that others aren't committed to the view. I had a great hope that socialist China was going to be a model and was going to be the answer to the world's problems. And went with that in mind in 1973 is when I went in 72, when the Chinese ping pong team came to the U.S., I was one of their escort interpreters for a couple of months and was invited back with other interpreters as a return visit. And I left in May of 1973, hoping to see a, not a perfect socialist society, but certainly a, an advanced one, a model. And the story of my experience, and I think of a lot of this book, is that one way or another, we started with a vision of China that had been generated by the Communist Party of China, wanting to project an ideal society outside, and believed it, and then went and saw that the reality on the ground was considerably different. That, I think, generated quite a lot of the aha moments in this book. I'd like Jeremy to say something about, uh, you know, as years passed, those of us who went early on would go to the usual suspect places, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou. But many of my own PhD students, uh, you know, <laughs> we want to get to some more outlying places, places that I had never been to and still haven't been to. So would you say something about your choice of location in China? Yeah, choosing Hainan or, or Justin choosing Xinjiang and that kind of thing, uh, Brent and Qinghai. I think a big part of these, the, the maybe part six and part seven, are uh, uh, people who, who traveled to China in a time that benefited enormously from the kind of work that, that Perry and Paul and, and others uh, did in terms of opening up channels of study um, and establishing, uh, establishing inroads that we could then expand. We could then go, uh, go to Hainan, go to Xinjiang, go to... Uh, uh, Inner Mongolia uh, or or um, or Qinghai, and and so benefiting from from these earlier China trippers is something that we kind of have an obligation to build on and and to move beyond uh, beyond the beaten paths of of the large cities and the and the uh, the archives. Yeah, let me add something here too about uh, what we were looking for uh, in our authors. That is to say. Uh, there's this dichotomy, and it's true everywhere in the world, of you know, officialdom elites, the, the master narrative voice coming from high above, and then ordinary life on the street, people who you bump into when you walk around the street. And I think what we were interested in is people who, regardless of what their own research agenda happened to be, were mixing with ordinary folks in the street who weren't officialdom, who weren't 
leaders trying to project some kind of model, you know, this is such a perfect place that we have and all of that. You got exposed to that. There was no way to avoid that, going to model units, especially in the early days. And there was the effort to make those represent the whole of China. You go to a model commune or a model factory or a model school. Yeah, this is, you know, what, what all of China is like. But increasingly, from my first visit in 71 to more visits in the 70s on into the 80s, I really wanted to interact with the person on the street uh, and, and, and maybe get a different view. And this is where a lot of the surprises came. That's what I particularly loved about this book were these, mm. uh, uh, the early stories in the 70s and uh, the travelers who were, who, who were really the pioneers. And we'll, we'll hear some uh, excerpts. We'll read some excerpts from the book. What were the Chinese thinking that you came into contact with uh, of all these, well, Americans showing up right at the tail end of the Cultural Revolution? On my first trip to China in 1973, except for the city of Guangzhou, the other places we went were foreigners hadn't been to at all almost. And so we were on the street immediately, these oddities. And people would follow, usually at a respectable distance, especially children. I felt like a comet with the comet's tail following me around. At one point, I turned around to some of the children and tried to engage them. I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the first one said, I want to go to the most difficult place and serve the people. And okay, and probed that a minute and asked, asked another one, how about you? What, what, what would you like to do? Almost exactly the same sentence. So this, this showed that they were curious about us, also a little bit frightened about saying the wrong thing in front of us, nervous considerably, of ordinary people on the street. Of course, the ones that were being our guides and bringing us around were more, more relaxed and we could talk more complexly with them, but there was still this sense of the we, the they, the nei, wai, yo, bie, inside and outside are different, that uh, as Paul points out, I anyway, and I think he and many others, wanted to get past and try to appreciate normal, untrammeled daily life. In, uh, I'll give you another example along these lines. Uh, in the early years, when you visited China for a longer or shorter term, you got put up in a unit, very comfortable unit generally, relatively speaking, for foreigners. And it was extremely hard to integrate into the rest of society. And a lot of us uh, reacted negatively to that. And by the time it got, in my case, to 1982, 83, when I was in China for a whole year, I simply made up my mind, I'm going to resist this. And by that time, I had enough ch friends in China. Uh, there was a family that actually offered to have me stay with them in their apartment to live with them. They had an extra room because one of the kids had married out and so forth. And I said, great. And we went through, you know, to the police, registered and so forth. Everything was proper and so forth. But uh, I remember bumping into a friend who worked at the American uh, uh, embassy at that time. And he said, I think you're the only American in Beijing living with a family. And that was 82, 83. The edu and I was there for a research purpose uh, at the Film Archive of China. But the education I got just living every day with that family, with a granny and some grandkids and so forth, what their life was like every day I got to experience. And it just was tremendously eye-opening for me. I'll add a quick example to what I said before. When these children followed us through the streets, the most amusing incident was in Beijing where we were walking by the Beijing Zoo. And some children with their parents who'd already bought tickets and gone in to see the giraffes and the hippos came out and followed us instead. <laughs> <laughs> the Cultural Revolution didn't end until 1976. Did you ever get any kind of far left uh, criticism or you imperialists would go home or any, any kind of negative feedback from, from the masses? You know, in my case, uh, and, and it's not just in the immediate aftermath, I mean, all the way up to the late 70s, uh, the early 80s, as things were opening up in lots of ways that allowed me, for example, to live with a family, nonetheless, you would, in my case, not on the street, I never had that sort of experience on the street, mm -hmm. but at the level of officialdom. You're, you know, you're going to bump into people, and I think that's probably true on up to the present day, you're going to bump into people, you know, who just uh, are not 
that happy that you know Chinese, you can pretty much wander around, talk to people, and they're going to, you know, sometimes I think make life difficult. That was true in my case in 82, 83. Uh, I saw, that's why I never generalize about people in the Communist Party. I know lots of people in the Communist Party in China, and there's a tremendous spectrum of people, all the way to, you know, real hardliners, you know, to people who are just, you know, amazingly open to all sorts of ideas. And I've, I have one friend now who I've had probably for 15 years in China, who's a member of the party uh, and tells me virtually every time we see each other that she believes in a multi-party system. I'll remain a communist, but I think we should have multiple parties and I think we should have elections uh, and so forth. And so, you know, it's the first time I heard that, I was blown away. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, yes, you are going to experience, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly. That's probably true in every country. Before we get into uh, reading a few excerpts from the book, how did you remember and recount your vignettes? Did you keep journals or have letters or recordings? How did you recall all this? For me, there were too many things to choose from almost. I didn't take a lot of notes or write diaries. I had some slides. But when I thought about what aha moments have I had, there were a few dozen that came to mind. And I picked three that I thought were more penetrating than the others and really went on memory. These are things that I'd noticed before and remembered before and even stories that I'd sometimes told before. So if anything, I had the, the slightly a burden of guilt. Am I polishing this story too much? Am I remembering it uh, smoother than the actual event? But I took from memory. Hmm. In my case, uh, I was a fanatical diary keeper from the first visit on, uh, and I still do it. I write down my thoughts. I write down what I'm seeing. And then to go back and look at something you wrote almost 50 years ago, it's, is, is that me? Did, did I write that? Uh, I also was a uh, borderline fanatical photographer. I loved, in those days we took color slides. And thank goodness, because those slides have held up really well. I mean, they look, they look, they still look wonderful. Uh, and it helps you to look at facial expressions, look at whether people had watches, look at the clothing they're wearing, how uh, gender changes in clothing. Women, for example, in 1971, when I first went, you know, as it moved forward, people adopting different kind of dress styles. Now, you know, when I go to China, uh, as I was last fall, and I'm about to go again this fall to teach a class, uh, when you walk out on the streets of Beijing, I feel like, you know, a bumpkin. <laughs> The people are dressed, you know, so beautifully and lavishly. So to keep track of these visual cues and to, and to keep notes and, as Perry said, just relying on your memory to some extent, the really vivid moments tend to stand out. You don't forget them. Why don't we hear a couple of stories? Uh, Paul, you want to read one? It could be your own or... Yeah, I have, uh, I have three in the book, one from the 70s, one from the 80s, and one from 2010 different experiences because I wanted to spread it out. But let me do the very first one. And it happens to be the first one in the book. And it has this intriguing title, Dirty Underwear. And the date is 1971. So I'll just read from it. Uh, uh, it was midsummer 1971, and I was traveling through China with a group of American graduate students, most based in Hong Kong, for a year of research on China. The group consisted of young middle-class men and women, whose passionate and self-righteous political views centered on staunch opposition to America's war in Vietnam uh, and so forth. Uh, as students of China, we all had an intense curiosity about Mao's China and considered ourselves fortunate to be in the first group of U.S.-China scholars since 1949 to get visas to visit China. China and the United States had no diplomatic relations. We thought of ourselves as goodwill ambassadors engaged in people's diplomacy. Like most of the others, my college and early graduate school years coincided with the rise of the student, civil rights, peace, and counterculture movements of the 1960s. It was not okay to behave like an elitist or to think that you were better than others. Uh, at the rhetorical level, and often in practice, students espoused egalitarianism. Men and women are equal. People of all colors are equal. The people of all nations are equal. Stand proudly with the underdogs of this world. So traveling through China that hot summer on a carefully scripted guided tour, we were exposed time and again to slogans and propaganda of the mid-cultural revolution period that emphasized some of the same themes. Don't act high and mighty. Live simply. Don't exploit others. Be one with the people. Our hosts were clearly reaching out with this message. 
We were all eager to counter stereotypes and wanted our Chinese hosts to see that ordinary Americans were not warmongers and spoke the language of peace and equality. This dynamic gave rise to some not-so-subtle competition among group members who wanted to show that their idealistic talk was not just empty words. This meant doing virtuous things and taking notice when others knowingly or unknowingly exhibited self-centered behavior. In my case, for instance, I made a decision at the outset to hand wash all my dirty clothes, socks and underwear included. With no laundries available, this approach made political sense. It was a superb example of living simply. How could I ask hotel staff members to wash my underwear? What kind of statement would that be? Instead, I would rely on myself. But there were two serious problems. First, as a simple student, I didn't have many clothes and ran out of clean ones very quickly. Secondly, everywhere I went, In the first half of this tour of revolutionary China, Guangzhou, Shanghai, Suzhou, and Nanjing were terribly hot and humid. I diligently hand-washed my dirty socks and underwear along the way, but nothing would dry out. None of the hotels were air-conditioned. So after each stop, I packed up my wet and by now smelly clothes and moved on to the next place. By the time I reached the Xinqiao Hotel in Beijing, the situation was pretty bad. In those days, it was often the case that hotels were completely empty. Lots of staff, but no guests. Certainly, if there were other guests, we would be, uh, they would be visible in the dining room. The Xinqiao Hotel seemed empty. I was in desperate need of clean, dry socks and underwear, so I set off one morning with a bag of my wet, stinking things. My room was on the second floor, so I decided to go quickly up to higher floors in search of hotel staff, hoping that none of my travel mates would see me. The fourth floor was deserted. It looked like all the doors were shut. Certainly, there were staff members somewhere. Suddenly, at the end of one corridor, I noticed an open door. I knocked gently on the open door and slowly entered with my sack of stinking socks and underwear. There were five or six young women seated on the beds or standing, and all of them looked up at me as I entered. No one said anything. Feeling uncomfortable and awkward, I spoke sheepishly in Chinese. Excuse me. I'm very sorry to disturb you. I don't mean to bother you. I'm in room 216, and I'll just leave this bag of laundry here and be off. No rush. Take your time. I slipped away quite proud of myself and not really wanting to deal with the issue of whether I was engaging in exploitative behavior. In any case, none of my travel mates had seen me. We had another busy day of guided tours of model revolutionary units full of apparently exemplary model citizens. Back at the hotel, we were finishing dinner in the cavernous dining room that was always empty except for us. Then I noticed that one of our minders, a pleasant young woman named Lee, was standing in the wings and waving me over. As I approached her, I noticed that she was holding that very same sack of stinking socks and underwear that I had handed over to the staff on the fourth floor in the morning. What is she doing holding my clean clothes, I wondered. What if my friends notice? But I could tell upon closer inspection that the unmentionables were not clean. They were still very damp and very smelly. Lee asked politely, did you drop off this dirty laundry on the fourth floor this morning? I said, yes, I brought it up to the staff. She said, those women aren't staff. She said this in hushed tones as she handed me the foul bag. Then she said, They are a delegation of women revolutionary fighters from the South Vietnam National Liberation Front. (laughs) Well, Perry Link, can you beat that? No. (laughs) Can't start. Uh, I'll read one that is first in the book, too. This is from 1973, 
And it illustrates the problem I mentioned a moment ago of my being an idealistic leftist at the time and wanting China to be a model worker's paradise. And then on my first trip to China, a few things happened that started me thinking uh, more deeply and, and having aha moments about it. It's called Broom Silk, 1973. <clears throat> My father was a history professor who, came, who became a devoted leftist during the Great Depression of the 1930s. My mother was the oldest daughter of German immigrants who ran a small family farm in Nebraska. I've met no one in the world who fits the label salt of the earth better than my mother. Her name was Beulah. She ate wheat germ and her favorite color was brown. Without knowing it, she caused a problem for me in May 1973 during my first visit to China. I was on a one month thank you tour that China's government offered to me and eight others who had served a year earlier as interpreters for the Chinese ping pong delegation that had been an important harbinger of the dip diplomatic thaw between the United States and China. I set out for China full of excitement, goodwill, and a desire born of my father's leftism as well, of my, as well as my own sharp criticisms of the United States war in Vietnam to observe a socialist paradise in action. One day, on a guided trip to a scenic spot near Hangzhou, I noticed a shop where small hand brooms were for sale. I thought of my mother. I had wanted to bring her a souvenir from China, and these brooms were perfect. They were crafted of sorghum stalks, light brown with dark flecks, lovely, and symbols of the dignity of labor, which she and my father certainly would like. Imagining that she might hang it on a wall in their living room, I bought one. As we boarded a minibus to return to our hotel, one of our guides made a point of sitting next to me. He appeared anxious, as if torn between handling an emergency and maintaining politeness. Why did you buy this? He asked. I explained about my mother. Let me get you a better one. He took the broom from my hand, went back to the shop, and soon returned with another, not much better or worse to my eye, but in his view, more nearly perfect. Then, during the ride back to the hotel, he began to interrogate me. Doesn't your mother like silk? China has silk. China has jade carvings. China has cloisonne. Why do you buy a farmer's broom to represent China to your mother? I began to realize that the guide saw what I had done as possibly unfriendly, quote unquote. My mother and I were looking down on China, he must have thought. For me, the misunderstanding raised a question that had not occurred to me before. Did this guide, deep inside, respect China's working people, the wielders of brooms, and want my mother to have the impression that China is silk only because he guessed that she, from a bourgeois society, would respect silk but not brooms? Or could the problem perhaps be even deeper? Could it be that the ideal socialist society of my mind was more theory than reality? Could it be that Chinese people, including this guide, only pretended to value brooms over silk? The answer wasn't clear to me, but the question opened a window. Two weeks later, our group was in Tangshan, in northeastern Hebei province, where we descended into the famous nearby coal mines. I noticed that deep down in the mines, there were signs for directions about safety, but no revolutionary slogans. In sharp contrast, on the Earth's surface, quotations from Chairman Mao on bold red signs with white or gold letters were almost everywhere. Still idealistic, I asked our guide, why there were no Mao quotations down in the mines. This suggestion caused her to scowl. Taizangle, too dirty, she blurted. Wheels began turning in, inside my slow mind. So, the dirt of the mines is all right for the working class, but not for the thoughts of its leader?
<laughs> Very good. Well, while Perry and Paul were in China when these stories were happening, you might have still been in uh, split pants, uh, Jeremy. <laughs> you came much later. How about uh, reading us uh, something from, from, from your time? Okay, I'll, I'll read the more recent of the two, Hainan Fishing Captain from 2012. Under a blue tarp strung between palm trees on a white beach in the heat of a Hainan summer afternoon, we got drunk quickly. My wife and I were the feasted guests of some new acquaintances, a group that included energetic retirees from Beijing and some local fishermen. Our hosts had invited us to the secluded and hastily assembled restaurant for a late lunch. To reassure us that the food was good in spite of the place's ramshackle appearance, one of our hosts told us that it was a favorite hideaway for big officials and their xiaosan, or mistresses, literally little number threes. I was new to this part of Hainan and grateful for the welcoming gesture. The food really was exceptional, the beer was refreshing, and our glasses were never empty. The conversation, which was uproarious, was mainly about amusing differences between China and America and included plenty of jokes about the insatiable appetites and unaccountable excesses of the place's big-wig clientele. Eventually, the beer and the sun took their toll on all of us and the talk mellowed and slowed. I was more than ready for the customary afternoon nap, xiuxi. But then one of our Beijing hosts seemed to regain his focus and seriousness, and he squinted at me. You study Hainan's heroes, right? You know he's one. He jutted his chin toward a quiet companion who sat a bit apart from the group. The man, lean and darkly tanned, wore a goatee and was smoking a maroon-colored cigarette. His legs were crossed, he was dressed neatly, and he seemed comfortable in the heat. He acknowledged his friend from Beijing with a thin smile. My host went on, he's a fishing captain, detained in the Philippines, three months. My Beijing host leaned back to gauge my reaction. He crossed his legs, perhaps in a study of the captain. I had been following the news of flare-ups among the several countries that had claimed territory in the South China Sea. Even as we were enjoying that lunch in the summer of 2012, the issue of disputed maritime and island claims had reignited anti-Japanese sentiment in China. Violent nationalist demonstrations were breaking out around the country related to a series of arrests, detentions, and diplomatic incidents around the Jiaoyutai or Senkaku Islands. American destroyers plowed through on their, quote, freedom of navigation operations, unquote. I knew enough to keep my research work safely distant from this kind of topic because mention of it could complicate my access at the Hainan archives. My focus stayed on the early 20th century. Our host from Beijing turned expectantly to the captain, clearly hoping for some kind of speech for their foreign guests, but the captain did not oblige. When did it happen, prodded our host. The captain replied in a few dry words, reluctant to be the center of attention. But I was beginning to share our host's interest and blurted, was it great hardship? I remember his look of sober patience and another thin smile. Well, the jailers were really nice guys, began the captain. Our Beijing host scowled and started to speak, but the captain turned to him and continued, but we weren't allowed any alcohol for three months, and he held up his elegant cigarette. The cigarettes they gave us were lousy. The table erupted once more in laughter, and our Beijing host stood up, mopped his brow, and proposed a toast to the captain. So what advantages are there in the kinds of short stories and vignettes provided in this book as opposed to the, the more familiar journalistic or academic writing. Perry? Academic writers need to write in a kind of formal language that's going to be acceptable in a professional journal and read by people and compared with other things. And this leads to a sort of formality of expression, not to say indulgence in jargon, that is a barrier, I think, between ordinary daily life as experienced and the reader who absorbs it. So in this book, we were trying to get people to let their hair down, as it were. Don't worry about uh, your promotion, and this isn't an academic article, but tell us what really did change your mind, what really did move you. So in a sense, it's a concentrated distillation of what uh, we and others could learn rather than a more formal presentation. I think the advantage is really there. 
Now, let me add on to this. I agree completely with what Perry has said. Uh, and uh, for me, the goal in bringing these stories together was to get people to talk about what I might call shared humanity. That is to say, especially these days, I'm sorry to say it, but there's so much emphasis is I'm a citizen of this nation. You're a citizen of that nation. I believe in this religion. You believe in that religion. There's so many things that are uh, particularistic and constricting. Uh, now, all of that is true. We have to deal with that. That's part of the real world. That's true about China. It's true about America. Uh, on the other hand, guess what? We're all human beings. Uh, and, I, and I think what we're trying to get at is coming from so-called different cultures, different societies, different natures, uh, different uh, nations, you come together with people uh, and then you discover the shared humanity. Uh, and it should be a very obvious thing, but quite often it jumps out as something that I mean, it's almost embarrassing that, oh, how, did, how is it that I failed to recognize this earlier? There was so much emphasis on difference as opposed to similarity. And I think um, the official line, we've, we've talked a little bit about official narratives and, and sort of towing the official line. There is also sort of the scholar's official line, that is, that is to, to be omniscient and to have talk about the God's eye view, it's sort of the scholar's eye view of things where you really have to completely surround a subject and you're, ex you're expected to be sort of the Chen Wei, the, the, the sort of the, the authority on a certain subject. And this, out of the gate, this project really broke that idea down and got right to foibles. And it's in the title, the idea of tripping, uh, the sort of double <laughs> idea of, of stumbling, uh, going on a trip to China, but also stumbling. And, and I think... Almost every single author in the volume has some instant of, instance of, of, of stumbling, of tripping. And so starting the narrative in that way as a stumble is, uh, I, I think, a helpful way to, to, to access that humanity yeah. that Perry and Paul were talking about. And there's a third dimension he didn't mention just okay. now when we were dealing with the issue of what to call the book and we decided on China tripping. Uh, well, of course, there's the idea, hey, I'm on a trip to China. That's China tripping. Then there's the, oh, stumbling and falling. I didn't anticipate. But there's that third dimension, if I can go back to the 1960s and 70s, of getting high on China. <laughs> uh, and as Perry pointed out earlier, especially in the early years, many of us uh, showed up in China with you know, very high expectations about you know, what we might find there and, and, and something good for humanity was going on there. And uh, there were many, many cases of people <laughs> tripping out a bit on China. Jeremy, how has China tripping changed for foreigners over the times that are the period covered in the book? I think one of the really important things is for people who are traveling to China now to make the most of what has been done before, um, the kind of inroads that were that were laid by, by people who traveled to China and the kind of welcome that foreigners have received in China for, for decades now. And to make the most of those and to travel out to places like, like Hainan, like Xinjiang, and, and, and to go further afield. But then even within, within large cities, to, to not simply restrict oneself to the kind of areas um, that, that had been necessarily restricted for early, earlier China trippers. And then another thing is to, is to um, really get plugged into not just the official narratives that are coming out of China now. Um, and this is something that, that definitely Paul and Perry have, have pioneered in terms of literature and film as well. People who want to travel to China today aren't just limited to the kind of narratives that were coming out of China in the 1960s and 70s, but we have access to this, this enormous spectrum of voices out of China. Uh, so before you travel to China, you're going to be familiar with not just the official line, uh, so that those initial stumbling steps that you take in China are hopefully going to be better informed than, uh, than if you had only been uh, ha had access to the, the, the official line of, say, the Cultural Revolution. I haven't traveled to China since 1996, so I don't have a personal grasp of this issue the way Jeremy and Paul would. But I would argue that the fundamental problems of understanding the official narrative versus the ordinary daily life is still there. And the discovery that people on the ground in China are, as Paul put it, human beings like us, that base of 
common uh, humanity, I think, is still there. So while the number of visitors has increased and the availability of Starbucks on the corner and all kinds of things that were no undreamable in the 1970s are immensely different, those fundamental uh, aspects of understanding the official narrative versus daily life and discovering common, common humanity within daily life are the same. Yeah, I mean, let me add something here, too, about uh, that official narrative we've been talking about versus uh, what people are talking about on the street. One of the things I've noticed over all these decades, right on up to the present day, is how that official narrative, let's think of it as a circle. Without knowing it, you show up in China and you try to figure out right away how wide that circle is in terms of, you know, what you're likely to hear chatting with people on the street. And sometimes it really becomes very restricted. The circle uh, constricts. Uh, and then you go at another time and suddenly it's widened. I remember going, for example, in the late 1970s, uh, still pretty close to the Cultural Revolution, when the Democracy Wall Movement uh, unfolded. And here it appeared that the state was okay with people putting up, uh, uh, you know, posters and uh, open letters, you know, on, on the walls. And they called it Democracy Wall. And this was thriving. And I just by total coincidence, I happened to be there at that time, wandered over, chatting with people, and they're handing you letters that they'd written or off prints uh, in, you know, pre-Xerox pre days. Uh, and then you come back a couple of years later, suddenly that's gone. Uh, and then another time, you know, it widens out a bit and so forth. So that, I always find that to be interesting. And that's true in every country, in our own country. Uh, the political uh, discourse uh, takes on uh, different kinds of proportions uh, at different times. Uh, and to, to arrive in China and to try to figure out where that circle is at the moment uh, and what people are likely to say about any range of things about daily life uh, is, is fascinating to me. China today in the 21st century is hardly the China uh, we knew of the 70s and 80s. Back then, in those early days, what places were particularly off limits that you maybe today would be no problem to go to, but back then was absolutely out of the question? Yeah, this is a great question. I have many, many vivid examples in my own case starting especially uh, with the 70s. My first visit in 71, going right on through to 79. Already, we established diplomatic relations with China in 1979. So we were getting delegations and even individual visitors coming through from China. And from time to time, I would, I would offer to put up some of the visitors in my own home uh, or invite them to come over for a lunch or a dinner at my home. This seemed like the absolutely normal thing to do, did it all the time with visitors from all around the world. Yet in China, people's homes were off limits. You, the authorities did not want you in people's homes for a variety of reasons. Uh, in fact, in most apartment buildings, nondescript apartment buildings, there were people at the front desk. Uh, and uh, if someone tried to enter, especially with a foreign face, uh, you'd, you'd be challenged and the person bringing you in. So I had friends starting as early as, not in 71, out of the question, uh, but starting in 77, 78, 79 and through there, uh, I wanted to push back on this. To me, it seemed ex in, you know, entirely human to have a friend into your home. Uh, and I had friends in China who who were fully aware of the rules and absolutely resistant. And so they would bring me in to their homes uh, for meals, uh, even to stay overnight, occasionally on a short trip, just crash, you know, save the hotel bill and so forth. And to me, I loved it. Even though it was a far less comfortable than being in a hotel, I felt like, you know, I was really in with people uh, who I could talk to and it was completely natural uh, and so forth. The same was true about restaurants. I mean, there weren't that many restaurants, even in a city like Beijing, going all the way up to the early 80s. Uh, there were uh, restaurants uh, where if you showed up with, a, with a, a Chinese friend, the Chinese friend would not be allowed in unless he or she registered at the door. And what this meant, and I had many occasions like this where I'd go with a friend and 
would suddenly turn back at the front door because the person didn't want to register because it would mean the next morning at your work unit, literally that fast, you'd be called in by the boss saying, oh, a report has come in that you were at restaurant X last night with a foreigner. Would you need to write a report about you know what this was all about? So in 82, 83, there were two or three places in Beijing, everybody knew, where they didn't require registration. And this is where you'd go with your friends uh, and so forth. And uh, so that, that's the kind of thing I mean. It's something as basic as a restaurant, going to some someone's home for a lunch or dinner. There were officials who were adamantly opposed to this. And if they found out about it, you know, they would be in your face and they would want to know why you were doing that. There were other peoples in officialdom who saw no problem with it. Yeah, what's wrong with people going into, you know, each other's homes and, and, and interacting? So that's what the example I would give is personal space, access to personal space uh, in ways that we would consider entirely hospitable and normal. Were there any tourist sites that today are common sites that back in the 70s and 80s you couldn't visit yet? Any place closed? No, I mean, the places that were the must-see places and, and tour groups, you know, even as early as the, you know, after 1971, the tour groups were all taken to the usual places that you'd expect to be taken. Uh, once, I mean, now that you've mentioned it, I'm just thinking aloud here uh, because I took a couple of groups, uh, tour groups organized by UCLA uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s. And religious destinations were, were touchy then. Mm. That is to say, if it was essentially a museum like, you know, Buddhist uh, destination, uh, a temple and so forth, you know, fine, this was the one that was on the approved tourist list. But if you wanted to go to a place that really had an active community, of, of monks and so forth, or to go to a, a Muslim mosque, you know, which I did. I took a group once, and it was high tension because uh, I, I had to force. I said, you know, they want to see a mosque. They, it was in Xi'an. They, they want to see a group wants to see a mosque, and I got a lot of pushback from the tour guide, who I think she didn't care, but knew that this was not something that we were supposed to do. And so things were said like, well, you can go in and look around, but, you know, don't talk to anybody and, you know, that sort of thing. So if you just kept your mouth shut and went to all the approved sites, no problem. But if you were a little bit pushier and said, well, what about this? Or if you knew something and said, there's this other place or maybe we can go here or there, uh, people would get nervous uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it might or might not happen. And, you know, to the extent that that might still be true today, I suspect it probably is, you know, that if you wanted to go to uh, a Christian church, for example, it could be organized, it could be done, you know, but there'd be a degree of, of, of nervousness probably about it. And, and what kind of what kind of subjects, if mm. you broached them back then, elicited uh, that nervous laughter that you just didn't want to talk about quite yet? Wasn't what time wasn't right. What Paul said, I completely agree with everything in uh, but he was talking mostly about physical space, where not to go, you can't go into homes and you have to register. <laughs> Your question now is more about intellectual space. Mm -hmm. That is, where could you ask questions and where was it difficult to ask questions? And I had a lot of experience with this in 7980, which was the first time I lived for a whole year in China. And I was studying contemporary literature. The scar literature was after the the death of Chairman Mao was a big phenomenon then. So I interviewed editors and writers and publishers and it was clear that some questions were hard to ask. You, what have you written and what is it about were okay to ask. But if you start to probe what really happened during the Great Famine, what really happened to Lin Biao, uh, was there really violence like this in the Cultural Revolution and what did you think about it? Those were very awkward and the atmosphere would tense up if I raised that kind of question. So over time, I devised a strategy in my interviewing of, what would you call it, uh, indirect raising of the questions. I would pretend that I was more naive about these things than I was. I was this young at the time, uh, white face who was blinking and saying, gee, what really happened during the famine or the Lin Biao incident? Playing naive and not proposing any answers myself just raising the question and then letting the Chinese person decide how far to go and how much to go. I found that worked a lot better because if I were to ask bluntly one of these sensitive questions, the freezing response would come immediately. But if I were simply to raise the topic, pretend I was naive and back off, 
I found not only were the answers forthcoming, but sometimes, especially among the writers, they wanted to tell these stories. They really started rolling and unfolding, and then I could take notes and let them decide where to bring the answers instead of me bringing them. But th that question of how far can you go intellectually and when have to, do you need to come back was at the time vague. The borderline was vague, and it still is vague. The vagueness is one of the reasons why it's effective. Uh, Chinese people have this experience even more than I as a foreign researcher do, but if you know that you can get in trouble for doing X, but you're not sure exactly where the borderline is, you're especially ready to do self-censorship about it than if the borderline were very clear. If it were clear, you'd know, I don't do, go there and I stay here. But during that year in China doing interviews, I constantly had this this fear of the vague borderline. And the way I handled it is what I just said. I, I let the other side decide where to go. And I think these, these lines move again, as Paul and Perry have been saying, over the years, where, where that, that, that circle of what the, what the party line is changes. And we've spoken a little bit about this uh, just on our, on our drive down here. We were, we were talking about... Um, the, the, the changing temperature of Sino-U.S. relations, but that's especially official Sino-U.S. relations. And, and if you take the time, and one thing that I think every author in this book has done is take, take a lot of time, and, and you too, um, uh, taking a lot of time in China to create relationships in, that, that are really genuine friendships and, and companionships that aren't simply dai biao shema. You know, you're not just representing something. You're actually just there as, as a really genuinely curious individual at a, at a human level. Then you start to have real conversations, even if it's in, in, in the, the, the main room of an archive uh, with the archivist. And the archivist realizes this is what you're doing. You're not here to, uh, to, to, to simply represent Washington. You're not here in the, in the, the hinterland of China to, to do a certain kind of deconstructive, uh, really uh, politically challenging project that, that has that, that simple kind of blunt force effect. And when those kind of conversations and relationships uh, happen and they, they become established, then this whole world uh, opens up in which, as, as, as Perry was saying, I think, not only do, do interesting things happen in the conversation, uh, but actually you, you find out, well, I've been asking the wrong questions all this time. And somebody says, well, the question you should be asking is this, and, and this would be the, the, the more interesting conversation. So. Um, the, the structures and the parameters of those kind of conversations change when you spend a lot of time with people and you just establish that human connection. How does China Tripping provide specific insights on U.S.-China relations during the periods covered in this book? I think an important thing that, that's happening in this book is that it's not especially convenient either for Beijing or Washington to tell the stories that we're telling. We're not really, uh, certainly not, not tooting anybody's horn in terms of a nationalist agenda uh, or, a, or, or, or any kind of uh, uh, political agenda. Because what happens is we start to talk about the everyday, the, 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 the encounters that people have uh, in everyday life, and that gets at um, big questions of diversity, obviously. Uh, which should go without saying, um, diversity of opinion in, in China, obviously, with, with 1.4 billion people, should go without saying that you're going to have 1.4 billion perspectives. But uh, unfortunately, from an American perspective, that's not necessarily the case. We have too many people, I think, in this, in this country, in, in Washington, but also throughout the, the country as a whole, who have a very monolithic understanding of China. Um, and then from, from Beijing's perspective as well, there's obviously this, 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 this desire sometimes to streamline certain opinions into a kind of official narrative. And so what we're doing with this book is, is, uh, is challenging both monolithic perspectives uh, from either Beijing or Washington's uh, side of it. And so we, this, this is a kind of public diplomacy. And I've, I've worked a little bit with some folks from the World Affairs Council, and they do this kind of uh, this kind of exchange as well. And it's a really wonderful project because it gets us, it, it bypasses the, the relationship between Washington and Beijing uh, into a, a, a conversation between 
um, the people in these two countries, yeah. as opposed to simply being sort of funneled through this official narrative. Yeah, that's a great answer, and I agree completely. And as I said a while back, what we like to say we were doing many, many, many years ago was what we call people-to-people diplomacy. Uh, some people now call it second-tier diplomacy. It's just leaving out the elites and the governmental, you know, big shots. And uh, the main agenda is destroying stereotypes. That is to say, uh, Americans, whatever that means, uh, you know, have stereotypes about the Chinese, whatever that means. The Chinese have stereotypes about, you know, Americans and foreigners. So our job is to is to mix that up, uh, to really break down the stereotypes and talk about ranges and spectrums of behavior and attitudes on both sides. Uh, and they turn themselves into these aha moments where one side or the other is going, ah, oh, no, now I understand something I didn't understand before. And it's heartwarming in many ways, even though it might be uh, uh, distressing or upsetting to, to learn something. And we're going to end part one of this discussion right here. We'll continue on in part two with more conversation and readings from this new book, China Tripping, Encountering the Everyday in the People's Republic. Thanks for listening.